Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Modern Day Podcast. Once again, you didn't ask for it, but we're bringing it to you anyway. Uh, today's episode was brought to you by Audible. You can get a free audiobook download and a 30-day free trial at www.audibletrial.com slash James. Maybe I can learn how to speak if I listen to more audiobooks. Um, there's over 180,000 titles for you to choose from for your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or MP3 player. It's a uh, little company known as Amazon, if you ever heard of them. Uh, it's also just, brought, a little one. just a small company. <laughs> yeah. Also brought to you by Skillshare. You can get two free months of Skillshare using my link. It's skl.sh slash modern day James. Uh, and it's also brought to you by patrons on Patreon. They're awesome. If you want to get some art lessons, group lessons, um, access to my Gumroad videos, or um, what else do we have? One-on-one -on -one lessons and live stream archives. It's all on there. And all of these podcasts will be available on iTunes and Spotify. So check that back later. I'm joined here by Tony Hawk's cousin, <laughs> the, <laughs> the awesome Seifel Hawk. Hello. How you doing, my friend? I'm not Tony Hawk's cousin. Oh, it's I'm a much, shame. I'm much too brown for that. <laughs> <laughs> well, for those who might not know, why don't you uh, give a little quick introduction to yourself? Um, my name is Seifel Hawk. Um, I'm not a skateboarder. I'm a concept artist and a director. And I'm uh, currently working over for 20th Century Fox at Lightstorm Entertainment uh, for the Avatar sequels. Awesome. Yeah. Um, I think we've had all of your coworkers on so far. <laughs> <laughs> no, not all of them. Not all of them. We're, we're working on that. We're trying to get all of them. Um, so how did you get started? Like I, your progression seems really interesting to me. Where did you start? How did you get in? Like what was the earliest memory of you doing art? Basically, how did you get started on this whole path? <laughs> I don't know if I'd call it a progression <laughs> <laughs> then this this digression <laughs> um you know i've always i was i've always drawn as a as a kid and and art was always a way to escape the real yeah. world but i never really drew for fun interestingly enough i, I never really drew to share um designs as a, mm -hmm. as a child I, I would draw things out from outside like a leaf or a bug or uh in the library there would be those books that would have all those airplanes and boats and yeah. i'll draw those i would do the exploded views too uh, awesome. that that's that shit blew my mind as a kid and for me i was almost trying to study it in a way yeah because i didn't really understand it whether whether it was technology or biology um i was drawing it out of curiosity <laughs> yeah um don't mind her no no no, no, no. <laughs> actually the the cat is uh Probably one of the cutest <laughs> things I've ever seen. She is wonderful. I don't know if it's a dog or if it's a cat, but... It's one or the other. I mean, it might be a, a half-breed or something because she runs around like a dog. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, you know, I, I don't know when it really started. I, I never thought of myself as an artist at first. Okay. Um, it was always drawing to escape, like I was saying. I think the moment that it might have hit me as a possible career path was in mi in middle school. I would uh, do some drawings, and the, and the instructor at the time would tell me that I should think about going to art school. That yeah. that maybe it was a possible career path that I would enjoy. Um, and when I got to high school. I kind of picked up Photoshop. There was like this class, it was like graphic arts, and it was basically an introduction to Photoshop. And through that class, I had convinced the school to buy a Sony VX2000. It was a, it was a film camera at the time, yeah. a digital film camera. And I promised to record school events. Okay. <laughs> but like the, the uh, basketball games, football games, the sports rallies, and I did. And I would edit them in Sony Vegas. And through that process of learning Photoshop, drawing to study kind of the world and, and filmmaking, I realized I really, really enjoyed creating moving picture. Okay. Interestingly enough, um, so I never really set out to be a concept artist. Interesting. And I'm happy. I'm I'm very very happy being one now. And I, I guess I'll get to that point. 
but when I was making my own films on the side, yeah. <laughs> when I wasn't doing a sports rally, I would um, get my friends together and we would shoot short films. And, you know, I would write them and then watch them kind of develop before my eyes while I would capture the the footage and I would edit it in the editing room, which I'm sure you're very familiar yeah, with. Yeah, a lot of editing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I think that process is very arduous. It, yeah. You know, you start off with this idea in your mind of, you know, here's a story, here's this moment, here's this sort of emotion I want to convey. Mm -hmm. And boy, does it take a lot of work yeah, yeah, it does. to get it to communicate across the screen. Yeah. And when you show your audience a piece of film or, or video that you've made, it's extremely nerve wracking. Yeah. You know, and, and when you show it, it's almost like opening up your soul and saying, hey, am I, am I ugly inside? Yeah, yeah. Do I have things to say that are interesting? And whether you're six years old or, or, or 42 or, or, or 100, you've got an opinion about any piece of moving picture you've seen. Yeah. More, almost more opinions about moving picture than a static image. Mm -hmm. And those little micro moments I would have where the emotion that I was trying to convey in a scene, in a student short film, kind of worked. Yeah. Where I would see someone's eyes light up or breathing almost change. It was, it was almost like controlling the undulations of someone's physiology as they were watching yeah. the light that you had designed. And, and I, I think that's the first time that I got really interested in art. Yeah. It wasn't just filmmaking, it was designing light. And in the sense that light emanating from a screen or a projector, it was like opening a window to a world that only you really fully saw. Yeah. And it was a really fun way to like share feelings and ideas. And I think that's what really got me into it, which was videography and filmography and direct directing in high school. That's so incredible because it, it seems so different than most people that I've spoken to so far. And even just the way you explain it is, is probably the most artistic <laughs> explanation <laughs> of, of art as a, oh man, that's so cool. So, okay. So you're, you're doing these short films in, or you're, you're working in high school and how does that, where do you go from there? Uh, you know, I, I wish I, I did more films in, yeah. I, in high school, but I also was so interested in graphic design and, and in painting. You know, mm -hmm. I, I think my, my weakest sort of characteristic is that I get interested in everything yeah. and it's like so <laughs> bad to, con to be able to concentrate. Yeah. Right? Um, I think that's a symptom in general of a lot of creative people is that you want to do, you want to dabble in so many different things. Yeah, yeah. I mean, in my experience, I was in medical school in a metal band wow. and it, now in art, it's just but always, always bouncing back and forth between multiple ideas and it's just can never really stay focused on one thing. Yeah. Did you, did you find that when you were in medical school or when you were in a scenario that wasn't necessarily quote unquote artistic or, or as creative that um, when you came back to the creative field, you, you almost remembered moments or, or memories from those non-artistic times. Yeah. Did that influence anything in your own art? I'm trying to think if it influences, I know it influences my, the way I approach it in terms of like, I, I come to it with a lot more appreciation than I used to, because I know yeah. what it's like when I wasn't doing anything creative. Yeah. And there was this constant longing to do, to either do music or do art and kind of share that. Yeah. Uh, and for me in medical school, it really was devoid of a lot of creativity, obviously, because you're just, it, it can be if you're doing research or if you're doing uh, like pushing the field. Yeah. But in my lowly medical school position, I wasn't doing that at all. Mm -hmm. And uh, I ended up catching myself drawing all the anatomy, drawing in the anatomy labs. And I wow, was... did you guys have those cadavers? Yeah, we had. Man. Uh, yeah. In Art Center, we got the chance to go to USC and see oh. those cadavers. I've got to say the smell is rancid. <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> but man is a human body. Fucking yeah. wild. It, yeah, it's incredible. It's incredible. It's it's if you've ever seen a mech or if you've any seen any work of like uh, like Vitelli mm -hmm. and like the suit from Ghost in the Shell, wait till you see a human cadaver. Yeah, it is fucking insane. Yeah, that, and everybody listening, go and see. <laughs> well, they have that. They have that exhibit, Body World. Right? Yeah, yeah. And th th there's a point where they had actually taken a human brain and they dissolved all the tissue except the veins. Oh. 
holy shit dude he was like looking at a nebula it's, it's so crazy it's it's insane and you know like it, it gives you appreciation for your body and kind of your health yeah and that's kind of what i got out of that but as an artist it it, it kind of lets you see the underworkings of how this robotic structure works right yeah it's, and so it's, it's incredible. a good thing yeah there's this um it's a simpler structure than the the vasculature of the brain but just looking at the forearms and the muscles and how those pull each bone in the hand oh my god so incredible it's 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 like looking at a an instrument yeah yeah it's yeah. so incredible uh now i don't remember where we were going with that but <laughs> <laughs> well to to reel it back uh so uh, yeah i was i was in high school and i was doing uh directing and filmmaking and i signed up for this scholarship called Ryman Arts. Okay. And that was funded by uh, Herbert Ryman from Disney. Okay. And it was an opportunity to get uh, kids from uh, certain areas that didn't necessarily have uh, a great art education and get them to USC's campus to take uh, free art lessons. And on top of that, they give you free materials. I mean, every possible acrylic, oil, paint, oh, wow. every single brush, every single pastel pencil. Yeah. There's a thousand dollar kit that is handed to you. That's incredible. Yeah. Jeez. And as a student, it's like being given a, a weapon. It's just like, holy yeah. shit, what am I going to blow up with this? <laughs> right. <laughs> and, and, um, man, that was, that was a life changing experience because on my own time here, I was trying to learn filmmaking and, on the other side, on the weekends, I was learning how to draw, how to paint from fine artists over at USC. Okay. And people that uh, were somehow associated with either Disney or the artist community, people I've, I had never met. And they gave me an appreciation for the artistry behind art. Yeah. The, 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 the journey it takes to, to finish a simple sketch mm -hmm. that you and I will look at and... and and love but not really necessarily know what it might have taken to get yeah. there and so i was at a crossroads <laughs> it, uh at the end of high school I, I knew i wanted to do filmmaking more than anything in the world mm -hmm. and i didn't do it <laughs> <laughs> go on <laughs> I told you this is not a linear path. No, it's great. I love it. <laughs> I'm like a, I'm like an atom. I'm bouncing around. Yeah. Um, I didn't do it. I applied to Art Center for film. It was the thing I wanted to do more than anything. And I heard from students in the school currently taking the courses there about the amount of money they were spending to do their classwork. You know, you had okay. to, some of these students own their own cameras and yeah. some of these students were spending thousands of dollars to, to do their assignments. You know, it wasn't writing a paper. It wasn't buying a $2 piece of illustration board and just doing a painting yeah. with free acrylics that got handed to you yeah. at, a, at, a, at a scholarship program. It was thousands of dollars just to do your homework. Oh my God. Yeah. Talk about student debt. <laughs> yeah, Jeez. I that's that was a really heartbreaking moment for me because I came to this realization that filmmaking in many ways was was a rich man's dream. Okay. And I was poor and my family was poor because we had moved here from Bangladesh. Um and I felt that I couldn't take on that responsibility of debt yeah and i didn't do it <laughs> and i ended up going to uh glendale community college okay and i took courses there that i found interesting while i was thinking about what to do so i was working at a shoe store to make money and uh, i was taking classes in psychology physiology uh, math science um, physics Things that I had questions about as a kid while I was yeah. looking at the world. I mean, here was an opportunity to learn about it because in high school, uh, I didn't really have these courses. Okay, yeah. And so, so long as I was stimulating my mind, I figured I wasn't lost. Or at least that's what I was trying to tell myself. Yeah. Um, but in that process, I learned about Art Center's entertainment design program. Um, I had gone to Art Center's campus and I talked to Thomas Bertling, who was a faculty member there. And I learned about this whole program that designed films. I had never in my life ever connected the two, filmmaking yeah. and art, 
right? Yeah. And I was like, I always saw them as two completely yeah. separate things. And boy, was I fucking wrong. Yeah, yeah. And I was absolutely inspired by the teams of creative people that it took to bring a script or a game idea to fruition. And I was Googling concept art for the first time <laughs> in my life back in 2009. Okay, wow. Yeah, I had never, ever looked it up. I didn't even know it existed. I had seen some game art, but I always figured that was just an artist that was inspired by the game, but I never knew that it, that's what it took to actually make it. So that connection was made, and I decided that if I couldn't afford to make my own films through production costs, then I could definitely afford paper and pencil, and I could definitely do entertainment design. Yeah. And so I went to Art Center for entertainment design. Oh, finally. There you go. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I kind of adjusted, and I shifted my path. Um, and that was a very awesome experience, man. It was yeah. the hardest thing I had done at the time. Um. For anyone here that's that's listening, that's thinking about going to Art Center, and that is also looking at Patreon and Gumroad and 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 other educational sources, one thing I got to tell you about being in a classroom that's not a digital environment, and especially in a school that doesn't just have concept artists, yeah, is that when you're in the atmosphere of very hardworking individuals, people that are artists but are so passionate that they work themselves almost to the bone. Yeah. It it it's an atmosphere that cultivates at least for me it cultivates creativity. Yeah, I think so. It's 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 that thing about creativity being or necessity being the the, you know, creating I forgot the phrase now. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it's like it's like a sandbox in a way, right? Yeah. I I think the, the we were talking about this earlier that when you have a white canvas and mm -hmm. you can you can paint anything, I'm completely still with fear. Yeah. I can't paint anything. I've never wanted to paint just anything. It's always had to be for a reason or for a purpose. And I think an educational experience like Art Center gave me that. It made me question why. More okay. than anything, why am I doing this? Why am I drawing this line? Why am I doing this particular design in a particular way? And it started to back paddle towards filmmaking again. Okay. And I'll give you the very short version of this. I, 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 three years into Art Center, <laughs> I backpedaled and I decided to take film classes. And God bless his soul, Tim Flattery, my department chair at Art Center, allowed me to create my own curriculum for the last two years. Oh, that's incredible. I, it's awesome. I don't know how it happened. And I had to do a lot of proving myself to the film department and talking to the president of the, the, film program at Art Center. But they allowed me to take whatever classes I wanted so long as I had the work necessarily to get the prerequisite. So I had to prove myself with some film work. And so I spent that summer filming. Oh, that's so cool. Yeah. And the, the last two years of Art Center were film classes and fine art courses. And I, I graduated, <laughs> I graduated with this very high hope of continuing it. And then the real world hit me. I think this, this goes for anyone in school, yep. any kind. The universe acts with the same indifference as rain. <laughs> you are not special. You are talented. But you do not in any way or shape or form deserve a handout. Yeah. You really have to work hard. E even with your podcast, this is a this is a full time job. You have to maintain it. Yeah, it's challenging for sure. Yeah, and you know what? I didn't get a jo a job in directing. I was fortunate enough to direct a few things, like yeah. a commercial and a music video, and those were absolutely amazing experiences that I was able to learn. But I needed to prove not only myself to myself that I could do it I needed to also prove it to the world or to prove it to an industry right and after I graduated Art Center and my, for the first year I did a commercial and a music video but things got kind of dry I didn't get as many requests to do uh, directing jobs or I didn't win as many pitches okay um, so the, a process of getting a directing gig is that 
you have to pitch a direction, you know, and because I was a concept artist, I could draw um, the ideas that I had in my mind. Yeah. Uh, but a lot of those ideas are very high budget. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and that, you know, that seems like something a concept <laughs> artist would do where they have this crazy CGI yeah, requirement. Yeah. 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 It's uh, actually surprisingly enough now, all of my ideas are not high budget anymore. Oh, okay. And so, they've changed because I've taken an appreciation for for directors that are able to not use visual effects sometimes. Okay. Um, like uh, Christopher Nolan as an example. Um, but I, after, I, after the commercial and the music video, I kind of felt that I needed to learn more before I kept creating film. Yeah. Anything film. Only because my instructor at Art Center um, had told me that be very careful with the films you make and with the content you release um, because it's so rare you know you don't you don't necessarily direct a hundred thousand projects you, know, yeah. you do a hundred thousand paintings in your life or maybe not it's, well, it's possible you'll have more paintings <laughs> than, than directorial debuts or yeah maybe. yeah you know w with a painting or a piece of art it's very personal you know yeah you're by yourself you're in your room if you're like me the lights are off <laughs> right, it's very dark and it's it's almost like a ritual right you're in yeah. a zone you're in a tunnel and you're, and you're kind of exploring what's in your mind but when it's film it's uh it's doing that with a team and and, and the weather mm -hmm. and sometimes stuff goes wrong yep <laughs> sometimes a lot of stuff goes wrong <laughs> and it's 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 interesting that at that point when I was at a very low point in my life, I actually found hope to go back to concept art, to learn as much as I could before I attempt the next moving picture. Yeah. And so I, a year after Art Center of just directing, I jumped back into concept art and I uh, worked at this studio called Section Studios in downtown. And there was a great experience. I, I got to I got to learn a lot about the inner workings of making a video game. Um, it was a, it was a small studio, but it was section was full of a lot of heavy hitters from Sony okay. from the God of War team. I mean, we had people like Kate and Manning who was sculpting the most insane fucking creatures. Yeah, and he was only like a few desks down, and uh, I was working with uh, Gabe, Dylan. Brian, Cuba, and they were some of the most down to earth, regular, awesome people. Yeah. That happened to be fantastic artists. Yeah. And I just gravitated towards that sort of an environment and that that's th those sorts of personalities because I, I realized that there was a beauty in people's art when you began to learn who they were. Yeah. You know, definitely. What I mean? I'm finding that with the podcast as well that like one, everybody I've interviewed is so incredibly successful but they're all the most humble people and i i've never heard them say one uh braggadocious thing about themselves <laughs> throughout this podcast I, I i don't think you can be braggadocious and be an artist i uh, yeah I, I, I don't know if that's possible it's kind of hard because you're always have to be so self-critical to yeah yeah a, a painting's a mirror right yeah and i and i think that's the the the, the hardest thing that um if you are too confident in your approach, you might forget that there's a hole in your parachute and the painting might fail. Yeah. And and so long as you're you're honest with yourself about where you stand in your abilities, I, I think that journey becomes a little bit less of an uphill battle where it's just, it's, it's kind of like, um, I, I used to do a lot of biking um, around the mountains and I used to do a lot of running. And um, I found myself focusing on my shadow when I would run or when I would bike. Um, especially uphill, it's very hard to bike yeah. uphill. Um, and I would go from Glendale all the way up to Chevy Chase Art Center. Oh, oh. Back down around the Rose God Bowl damn. and back, yeah. And one of the days it was raining. And um, I realized if I focused on my shadow and I just focused on my breath that I could finish. Yeah. yeah. And I mean, we talk about this a lot at work, uh, especially with my office mates. I, I share an office with jo Jonathan Barube and Nick Jindro. Yep. And we talk about the, the concept that real artists, they, they finish. They really finish. And that's the hardest thing to do, to, to, to put something out into the world and say, hey, look, look what I made. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Because it, it's never in your mind, it's never done. But it's like 
you'll so often have something and say, oh, I can continue working on that. Yeah. But at some point you have to make that cut off and just release yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. I got into this really great debate with Jonathan and, Br and Nick. I, I love sharing an office with them because yeah. we, in our own respective, respective ways, see the world from a different point of view. Yeah. And what's beautiful is that we can kind of lock onto a cent central target and talk about it and not offend one another, okay. <laughs> which is very common in, in our day and age with, uh, uh, the internet, <laughs> the internet. <laughs> and it's, it's an open discussion every time. And it's, yeah. and it always goes back to art because you know, that's just who we are. It's, it's in our blood and finishing, finishing a piece of art or finishing any, anything, anything, an email, a text mm -hmm. to send it out. It's to relinquish control. Yeah. To, to let go of the, the tethers to it, right? And to let it kind of grow on its own, you know, whether, whether that means a thousand likes or a thousand dislikes or no likes or no comments. Yeah. And that's a really scary thing in our day and age, right? It is a bit scary, for sure. Yeah. yeah. It's like with the platform of like sharing art, like you, you don't need a gallery space, right? You yeah. don't need to rent out a gallery. You don't need to put your name on a billboard. You put it on Instagram. Yeah. And the gallery is going to reach way more people than any fancy location you would have yeah. paid for. And whether you're six years old, 16 or 60, it's the same thing. You don't, deep down inside in your heart, I truly believe you're always the same. Yeah. And it, 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 it influenced my decisions at the time. The internet, Facebook. Yep. I would at the time there was art station didn't exist. Um, but Facebook did. And I followed every artist that I liked. And I would scroll. <laughs> it's such a beautiful design. This yeah. this rectangular <laughs> window. Yeah. To gallery spaces, right? I mean, I know everyone has their own experience with a cell phone. Here's mine. Okay. <laughs> I uh outside of looking for funny memes. Okay. And going on Reddit. <laughs> Reddit's great. If you yes, don't know what Reddit it is, is. Yeah, it's a wonderful website. Yeah, We actually check out this website called uh, What Could Go Wrong. It's a, it's a thread. So you go Reddit slash R slash What Could Go Wrong. Yeah. Check it once a day. It will make your day brighter. I promise. <laughs> awesome. Just so you guys know, go to that website, please. Uh, hopefully I don't ever end up on that website. Um, <laughs> so... This this window in my pocket in our pockets it's, it's it's the most powerful computer you can have in such a compact size right but it's a window yeah you know you lift it up and you can see anything it's a portal and I was looking at other people's art and I was scrolling like it was a slot machine scrolling scrolling and every single person was better than me you know I, I think going to art center. I did have a bit of an ego where I felt that I was getting an art education and I was getting a degree and it was very linear. It wasn't, yeah. I wasn't really seeing the world and I was almost just seeing myself in the context of the school. You know, it's easy to get, get lost when you're in a bubble Yeah. Uh, with certain groups of people because you begin to define your barriers based on where you stand compared to everyone else. And in many ways, that's healthy competition. It's, it's a great uh, way to improve and learn. Uh, but it can go, I think, a bit rotten if you, if you don't get out of that for a moment yeah. and look at yourself in the context of the world. And for me, the world was Instagram. Okay. And Facebook. And uh, I, I think while I was at Section, I would constantly beat myself down because I didn't, didn't believe I was a good concept artist. I, I was at the time uh, helping out with the art direction of some developing VR projects and I was doing a bit of cinematography and, and film for the games that we were doing and so it was my way to kind of stay I guess sane artistically. I was still exercising those muscles. Yeah. Um, but I was still longing for something more. I wasn't, I wasn't necessarily sure of who I was. Again, yeah. <laughs> it just keeps happening. Yeah. I, I, and I hope it doesn't stop, to be completely honest. It's sometimes that negative feeling or any sort of negative feeling is your best friend. 
Yeah. I find that anytime, I'm, you know, sometimes I think as an artist or when you put things out online, as we said, you have this tendency to to really respond to what people are saying or, or feel very critical of yourself. Yeah. And while that can be hard to deal with, yeah. I think sometimes it's the best thing because it pushes you forward. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I think it's almost like a reminder that you're in a, a almost a fluid sort of world right yeah it's not you don't just pick your slot in a line and you don't just go on that line and then aha you're at your your sort of career your goal yeah. you know it a lot of things kind of wax and wane and, and and a negative feeling about where you currently stand in art, your art currently could actually be used to empower the solution yeah right like it's good to to not be happy with your work I, at least i believe that yeah i think so I think it's like looking at your hairstyle back in high school in your yearbook and thinking, what the fuck was I thinking? <laughs> yeah. Well, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> right? Like, if, you, if you're if you going to continue that hairstyle for the rest of your life, man, go for it. Maybe yeah. it's great. Mine wasn't. I'll Not, tell you no, about no, that. No, 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 my hair was down <laughs> to my yes. shoulders. <laughs> oh, my Lord. I had the same thing. My hair was down to my shoulders. And yeah. as you can tell, I have really thick, curly hair. Yeah. And it was not pretty. It, yeah. It looked like a hornet's nest or a raccoon <laughs> or something. Well, I'm happy that you cut your hair. Thank it looks you. a lot better. Thank you so much. Um, I, I look like the brown Michael Jackson. <laughs> <laughs> I was like a headbanger and I had my hair over my over my face. Oh, my. It was that like cliche sort of artist, right? Yeah. Um, and I remember once I, I actually cut my hair. Uh, because I joined track and I would sweat a lot uh, during the practice and I didn't like having so much hair on my head. Yeah. And so I cut it and I and I never lost the feeling of needing to kick my hair back <laughs> <laughs> over my over like yeah. so my eyes were clear. And so I'd find myself just doing this motion without any hair. And so people would find me like look at me and they would think there was like some sort of fly in my face or something and then um is yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I it, it's you know it's a great ability to laugh at yourself. Right? Yeah. I would I would I I eventually got told that I was doing that, and I realized that and the next time I would do it, I would just laugh at myself, and and that in a weird way kind of comes back that like that's kind of what I started doing with my own work. You know, yeah. like fuck it, it's not gonna look great later. It's not gonna look good tomorrow. Yeah. You know, like if it's gonna look great tomorrow, then you didn't learn anything, mm -hmm. right? A painting is a shot in the dark, and and and, it, and if you have a target, a visual target in mind, you are just working towards its clarity, right? And yeah. only the foundations of knowledge from uh, schools like Brainstorm or Art Center, those foundations will give you the tools to clarify the what's this abstract impressionistic idea in your mind. Yeah. Oh man, that's. I could just listen to you talk forever. <laughs> we got to do a quick commercial break, so let me just do that. Oh my lord, this is awesome. Um, just so you guys know, uh, this was brought to you by Audible. Uh, Audible is offering a free audiobook download with a free 30-day trial. Check them, their service out. It's great. I'm personally listening to Man in the High Castle. Great book. Uh, check it out. And hop over to Skillshare. It's great. It's awesome. Mm. I'm taking Marco Bucci's Plain Air Painting. He's really wonderful. He's another art YouTuber. I don't know if you know him. I don't. He, you should check him out. He's really wonderful. Uh, and he's also a very nice guy. Also had the opportunity to chat with him. Um, but I have a question about your approach because I think one of the things that makes you so interesting to me is, is how you combine cinematography. So how does that, like, what is your workflow like these days? How, is, how does that balance between doing paintings or doing uh, any sort of cinematography work? It depends on the task. Okay. I, uh, I've caught myself many times making the same mistakes over and over. The types of mistakes that waste what I believe is the greatest resource, which is time. Mm -hmm. it <laughs> um, certainly is. And especially in a production environment, I find myself doing, making patterns of, of, of mistakes that are embedded in insecurity. Okay. Um, and so my process is how to alleviate the insecurity first and foremost and okay uh, allow me to clarify i know it's i get a bit romantic i'm so sorry no i, lo I love it i love it i can hear it. I just listen to it forever it's great i i you know the first thing that happens when i sit down to do uh if it's a shot for a film or a commercial or it's a painting it's always the same thing for me it's to to capture a moment 
in time. Yeah. Whether that's a sci-fi world, whether that's a daughter having a conversation with her dad at having breakfast at a table. What direction is the light coming from? What, where am I sitting? What is my relationship to the subject matter? What is happening in the scene? Yeah. How should I feel in relation to the main character or event or subject matter? And so I, I always start off with the key words that describe the emotions I feel, first and foremost. So if it's a script or if it's a personal painting that I'm doing, I write out a small paragraph or I take the small paragraph from the script. Or if it's a game, I take the game designer's intentions behind either what what's happening in the story or what's required for gameplay and i try to think of the experience am i supposed to have a lot of fun while i jump from this wall to this wall to get to the end goal am i supposed to understand that at this moment the character has a realization that she has been making the same mistake over and over and over again yeah or am i supposed to have a sense of peace as I look out into this vast landscape and I write down the emotions I feel. The main reason is I believe there's something lacking currently in our technology. Yeah. Um, There's no way for me to connect my heart, my mind to yours. Hence why we have mediums of communication. We have speech. We have literature. We have music. We have art. And I I really do believe that all of these are just a form of communication because there is no way to plug a USB cord into me and plug it into you. (laughs) And next thing you know, we both know Kung Fu. You know, like it's it's not. I wish. (laughs) I don't think either of us know Kung Fu. No, no, no. And you know what? I wouldn't want to learn it that way because I think that's what makes us human. Yeah, it is. It's the way we consume um, the world around us and what we take away from that consumption. And uh, when I start out with my own piece of work, I take what I feel and I try to figure out psychologically how to communicate that through the visual language of art, that being values, color, light, graphic shapes. How can I do this? How can I take the feelings I'm feeling and associate shapes that tap into the subconscious of the audience? Yeah. That when they see it, they don't even think it. They just kind of feel it. Yeah. And if you're very successful, they really feel it. And it's even more powerful in film because film is a moving picture. Yeah. You understand it more spatially. And there's sound, right? There's there's more... There's everything. Yeah, there's more threads being connected to your your mind or to your heart. Um, And for me, starting out with those key words, I then go to research on Google. You know, and, and the one thing I, I love and hate about Google is that the first hundred images, we probably also see the same one. Yeah. And so if we look up something scary or, or dementing or, or surprising or, or beautiful, we see similar colors and, and shapes. And uh, I look at that to know what not to do. Okay. That's interesting. Yeah. That's it, really was, interesting. it was a strategy I had yeah. done. Um, because I believe that it's a beautiful thing when, when you can add to add to a, a creative endeavor um, and, and not fall into the noise. I, I believe websites that have a lot of art, uh, like ArtStation, they they bring, especially in me, they bring up the anxiety of how much I suck. Yeah. Right. Like, man, I can't model like this guy. I can't paint like this girl. What am I doing? Why do I suck so much? Yeah. And you know what? I'm right. They are better at those things than me. And that's okay. I've got time. I can learn. Yeah. But for me, instead of going back to that small window of my pocket and scrolling and reminding myself how much I suck, I tell myself, okay, you suck. So sit down and get somebody to feel something when they look at your design. An intention. There's an intention behind that design. If they feel that, no matter how it trends on the internet or how well it does on ArtStation or how it's received 
by your Facebook followers. If my little sister or my wife or my mom feels something, yeah. I consider it a, a success for, for at least for the time being. Yeah. Oh, I mean, that's true. You can have any level of technical skill. And I, I know this mostly through music because I, I'm relatively unexperienced in art. But with music, you can be the most technical guitarist, pianist, whatever. But you could play a few simple chords and make the most beautiful pieces. And yeah. it, it what makes a better piece in the end is not just that technical skill. It's yeah. it's when you listen to that song, does it bring a tear to your eye or, you know? Yeah. And yeah. I had that experience the other day. I was listening to uh, Isn't She Lovely by Stevie Wonder, which is it's a beautiful song. You can just tell that, you know, there's thousands of more technical songs out there. Yeah. Not that Stevie Wonder's not capable of that, but that song will just instantly brings you to where he was. Yeah. You know exactly how he felt. You know exactly what's going through his mind. Yeah. And it's incredible when you can do that in art. And that should be the main goal. You know, the, the beautiful thing about Stevie Wonder, if you've yeah. ever watched a video of that man sing, yes. <laughs> yeah. that smile on his face. Oh, my Lord. Yeah. If you have that while you draw and you paint, or if yeah. you can find moments of that. I mean, don't get me wrong. I'm not sitting there smiling every single moment. Yeah. But if you can find moments, pockets of that while, you, while you're doing what you're doing, yeah. you're heading the right direction. Exactly. I mean, this is, of course, my own opinion. I, I think there's, there needs to be this sense of wonder and play, the kind that a child has. Yeah. Because a child hasn't seen Instagram yet. <laughs> they, they, they don't have... It's the... getting younger and younger. <laughs> I, oh, my God. I actually... Yeah, I, I, I saw a child... Uh, recently scrolling through Instagram and man did that, that did that mess with me because yeah it's weird Instagram uh, it's such a beautiful medium and, and it's it can result in such beauty uh, but at the same time it can result in in, in, in the rabbit hole of, of angst and, and anxiety yeah right? it's anything you want it to be right it, it just appeals strictly to your limbic system yep and it fires all those things in your mind and 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 you chase whatever whatever avenue is is appealing to you at the time and so if you're very depressed if you're in a low point you might chase that yeah and it's almost like a virus it will multiply and grow and you'll see more things and you have to kind of reel yourself back yeah right? and 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 that idea of play brings me back to my own sort of approach where it, it currently it whenever i can i try to get off the internet and i look at books and i look at things around me a lot yeah a lot like right now i brainstorm with my students they've been doing heavy research for their projects so they've got stuff from medieval times they they're they have to look up what fabricates those materials so if you've got an armor or a piece of armor you've got to find the hammer and the metal that makes it like okay. i need them to find how things are manufactured if they're creating a manufactured design right yeah you need to understand where something is birthed to then find uh how it comes to be right and and i threw <laughs> last week i walked into class while well, they've got the most beautiful research right and i was like all right fuck all your research and i threw a few vegetables on the table and i'm like <laughs> that's your research oh man <laughs> 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 the looks on their face man i it yeah. was worth every every penny it was yeah. at first why well, it was i had a piece of broccoli and, and, a, and a mushroom and <laughs> and i was like you know you can go on google google right now and look at a piece of broccoli and a mushroom, yeah right? but but it's uh it's a different when you look at it in your hands and we spent the rest of the class cutting the vegetables oh, looking man. at different regions of it taking photographs of it yeah and wondering how we'd utilize it in our design process and the way i kind of broke it down to them of how to approach this sort of abstract approach to design um was a pattern that i've seen in machine learning oh, okay elaborate on that because that's very interesting to me <laughs> <laughs> um so if you've ever uh typed in your password on a website yeah and it tells you hey are you a robot and it brings up like a funky image of like bunch of letters and like one of them is like super pixelated but you can tell it's a number nine mm -hmm. you you type it out and like okay a robot currently can't do that or an ai might be able to but you're probably human they let you through another example would be like it brings up like a google maps image of like cars and traffic and it's yep. like, okay select a hydrant and you select the hydrant right you're teaching the computer pixel by pixel what shapes mean what yeah that's a good point so the, the way neural networks work in machine learning, based on my very limited knowledge, 
is very similar to how a child learns, how you yeah. learned, how yeah. we learned. You know, when we were born, <laughs> you didn't just wake up and say, hey, that's a tree, that's a door, and I don't trust that guy. <laughs> <laughs> those, those, those things only come about, right? Yeah. Yeah. And how did they come about? You know, somebody had to tell you, this is a square and this is a triangle. And you had to memorize those shapes. And it gets much more complicated when you have to learn a language, right? Here's A, B, C, one, two, three. Hmm. And you're learning the shapes, no matter what typeface it is. Now you can tell what it is. Yeah. I mean, hopefully. <laughs> Most of us. <laughs> Which is probably why the highways are Helvetica, right? Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's the most legible font. Yeah. Designed by the Germans. <laughs> um, but all we're doing is pattern recognition. We are, in many ways, a computer. Yeah. I don't want to reduce us down to that. But it's, I find it a very beautiful way to look at the human mind. And if you're going to design a badass, scary vehicle that is strong and fast think of it from the perspective of a child what have they seen in their world that makes them feel those words so if you say yeah. fast maybe they've seen a bird and the way it dives when it's you know eating the flies above the grass right or if it's scary maybe they've seen a face with an underlight that was an unrecognizable pattern of shapes. Yeah. Right? Like, think of a simple image. I give an example in class, the, the first class, uh, of a face that was smiling. Right? And so you have a top light, three-quarter, whatever. Yeah. It's from above, from above you, and you can see someone's teeth, and they're smiling. And so you're like, okay, I trust this person, right? And now rotate that light to the exact opposite direction from underneath, and it's unnerving. It's, it's, yeah. it's if anything, you don't trust it. It's the same exact geometry. It's the same yeah. exact shape. That's so cool. And yeah. so in, in the class I teach at, our, at Brainstorm Advanced Form Language, it's not about the 3D shapes when I'm thinking about design. It's about the two-dimensional shapes they create yeah. in two ways. Actually, three. So if it's a matte surface, you have the actual curvature of, 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 a, of, a, of a surface. So if it's curved uh, or if it's uh, rough, Right, so you have a textural quality to it, um, and then there's the shadows they those surfaces cast, and then there's the shapes within the shape. So if it's a reflective surface, you know what are these beautiful sort of reflecting lines? You know, so if you look at like car design or transportation design, they're analyzing the the shapes of the of the reflections, the speed of them. Yeah, you know, almost like calligraphy, right? And so what three D shape creates those shapes okay. is what they're thinking. You know, yeah. and so you get these automotive. Designers creating these really beautiful forms that are inspired by um, these like curvatures and these uh, contrasts between tight turns and really sharp turns and really wide ones, right? And if you begin to see the world that way, you begin to kind of question and wonder psychologically, what has my machine learning algorithm stored in my mind yeah. that makes me feel the keywords I'm trying to design? And that's less intimidating to me yeah. than I need to design the next Iron Man suit. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's too much pressure. It's too much. It's Way too, too much. Yeah. Imagine a musician being told, you have to do something that sounds like Daft Punk. Yeah. You, you can't do it. It's, 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 you have to... I can't do it at least. <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, they're, they're pretty talented people. <laughs> <laughs> And actually, you know, actually talking about that punk, I remember seeing an interview with them where um, they talked about their own inspiration. Yeah. Like, like uh, the interviewer was asking them, like, how do you feel about sampling music and stealing? And I talked about my students about stealing uh, shapes. Mm -hmm. and, and in the case of Daft Punk, they're stealing bits of sound, right? Yeah. And they're remixing it. And we're doing the same thing. I'm stealing shapes from animals, other pieces of sculpture or art that I've seen, anything I've experienced in my life or anything that I've seen on the internet. Yeah. Through the small window of my pocket, what have I seen that's made me feel, feel a certain way and how can I remix those things in an interesting way that someone calls a new, right? So you can take an old song today and match it with a, with a digital beat and it sounds new. Yeah. But is it? Or is that what new is? 
I think that, in my opinion, I think that is what new is. It's yeah. always going to be some sort of remixing of what has previously existed. Because yeah. I think human beings in general are just imitative creatures. Yeah. And everything that we create is just a process of imitation. And in my experience, it's only when you imitate enough sources yeah. that you can create something that ever appears or li- or sounds new. Yeah. I think in general, like, if you take any... And, and again, I always go back to music because I'm a little bit more qualified in that regard. But if you take any little bit or any small frame of the song, you can always, or you can identify sources saying, oh, it sounds like this person, it sounds like yeah. that person. But it's only when you take the whole picture and you blend those those inspirations or those uh, sources together is when you get something that sounds different or something that yeah. sounds new. Yeah. You know, there's a stigma about imitation too, right? Yeah. Like, mimicry or, or copying right? or master study or or inspired by this concept artist so i did this piece of work yeah and there's this stigma that um that it's not it's not dope it's not cool why'd you do that <laughs> yeah you know i i gotta say and everything i say will always be my own opinion this is what i truly believe and i don't think it's the right thing it's just what i felt with my heart was right yeah or at least at this time but imitation is a way to learn. Yeah, you know, if you see Kobe Bryant shooting a three-pointer with such utter skill that you watch it frame by frame, you're studying how he moves his physiology, right? Yeah. And I'm not saying you're going to watch that video and walk out of there and hear Kobe Bryant. Right? No, no. But it will make you perceive the undulations in your muscles and your, in your, in your limbs much differently. Yeah, you'll see it from almost like you're studying yourself from the outside, and I think imitation allows you to s- study your decisions compared to an individual that has already made these decisions and per- and mastered them to yeah. some extent. And I think that gives you a bit of a a spectrum. You know, it's a way you kind of find yourself at first, right? Like, who am I? Am I an artist? Do I suck? Right. Yeah. Like that's how I started out. Right. Yeah. And and when you start imitating, you kind of start finding these beacons that let out these like sort of radio waves of like, okay, maybe I'm interested in drawing mechs or maybe I'm interested in cinematography. And you kind of let that feeling go through your body. And you're like, this feels like the right direction. And it's a way to ground yourself on a journey, right? Yeah. It's like when you're on a hike and you see uh, a a sign or or a a landmark, right? It's just to remind you that you're still continuing a journey. Yeah. It's not the end goal. I mean, I hope it's not. Yeah. You can do much more than just imitate. But there's nothing wrong with it. It's, It's the way we learn. Yeah. And I don't think you can ever get to a point where you can do anything original without imitating. You can't. I don't think so either. Yeah. I used to... Um. I would even just take drawings and I would draw the same drawing line by line. Yeah. And I did this relatively recently too, within the last year or two. Yeah. And I really wanted to study why are they making these decisions? Why are... You know, you look at the like the best line artists. We were just talking about Kim Jung-gi. I'm a little too obsessed. But... <laughs> The way the decision making process, or uh, somebody like Evan Munson, I'm not sure if you're familiar yeah, with him. But, I love, yeah, I love, love that work. And I, I would try to retroactively see why he was making certain decisions, or, you know, and maybe to him, they're subconscious. Yeah. But if you spend enough time to think about it, then you can start to ingrain that into your, sub, yeah. your subconscious. You know, you know what I love? Uh, when I do a study, I love. I love finding the patterns of my own decisions Yeah, and how that takes me off the rail when I'm doing a study. My studies are never, first of all, I need to do way more of them. I'm, I'm not going to say I do enough. I mean, I used to share an office with John Park, and so I can tell you I definitely do not do enough <laughs> of them. And he has inspired me to do more. Yeah. Um, but what I've realized is when you go off the rails in your study, it kind of becomes your own version of a sergeant painting. Yeah. You learn about yourself as to what you like or dislike about your own decisions. You're not necessarily yeah. saying, hey, I'm not sergeant or, hey, I wish I painted more like sergeant. You, you, you may find that there is a little bit more eloquence in the decisions made in the master, master's yes. piece of art. Yeah. Know? Almost like a more eloquent or more simple decisions being made. Whereas when I would do a study, I would begin I would begin to be hectic and get lost. 
and and it's a reminder again it's like that journey that you are just get back onto the rails right get onto the path and just finish it yeah look at it take a few notes move on and i mean most of my studies i will, I will never share they're terrible they're horrible i'm sure they're fine <laughs> <laughs> they're terrible uh a lot of them were film studies of, okay. of, of frames because i absolutely love looking at cinematography yeah yeah uh like work from like roger deakins is one of my favorite cinematographers and uh finding the way that they control light i think is my obsession yeah, yeah. i can tell i can tell based on the way you've talked about it that that's <laughs> what you're so inspired by and it's amazing to to because like for me i have so many completely different directions that i'd want to go in art but it, yeah. it's so i can just feel your passion about it just, <laughs> just the way you talk about light and how it creates such interesting shapes and how it affects your psychology yeah, it's interesting. Right? At the end of the day, it's just wavelengths. Yeah, you know whether it's a painting or a projector, uh, or or a TV or your phone. Uh, if you can design that and make someone think something, yeah. or feel something, it's no different than music. It's no different than uh, a Broadway live play. It's no different than anything that you felt emotional about. And it's yeah. crazy because it goes beyond time you, when you're dead it's still around and it's not to leave a a sort of like legacy or anything like that i i i, I don't have those sorts of thoughts it's, it's never about me it's always about a frustration of trying to get something out that yeah. i'm thinking or feeling and when it's out it's out and it's done right and and that's what kind of inspired a lot of the stuff that i did in my personal work at over at art center that has that story about a guy that's in outer space and on this yeah. alien planet and um that struggle, I think, it's, it's, it's so long as you incorporate play and you're trying to attempt something that's very emotional or very close yeah. to you, it, it, it inhibits the uh, inner voice that says, you suck, you suck, you suck. Because yeah. the whole time, it's not that you suck, or at least in my mind, it's not that you suck. It's I'm not capturing the correct emotion yeah. that I'm trying to convey. I'm not getting it. Yeah. Study. Find the right shape. Go back. Redo. And it's like a new shot at the at the the bullseye every time yeah you know and each and, and it's just that you learn from your shots and you, and you improve in your accuracy the way kobe bryant improved on his three point yeah and and i don't think it, it i don't think you can immediately like when you first pick up a pencil the first time i don't think you can immediately express those emotions just yet and it's because you're inexperienced it, yeah. it it takes so long i know for me with music it took me 11 to 12 years before i really felt like i could express something wow, which is yeah. a long time yeah it's, it's, uh, and whenever I make a goal with art or anything like that, it's always such a really large time scale. Like, yeah. uh, I'm, I always go to myself, obviously when I, from day to day, I don't break it down into a 10 year plan, but yeah. I say in 10 years, I want to be able to do this. Yeah. And then I take smaller steps. But I, I think one of the, the frustrations that makes people put the pencil down or just stop completely is, is not being able to get those ideas out immediately. Yeah, and yeah. it does take a, a lot of patience. That is the biggest hurdle, man. Yeah. The the ugly drawings. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. The ones yeah. that people never show. And I actually mm -hmm. wish and I would advocate that professionals show them. Yeah. Including myself. I I uh I talk to my students actually every single homework assignment I call it ugly sketching. I say I'm not. I don't care about your rendering style. I don't care about your brush set. I don't care if you do it digitally or by hand. If it's coming out of you, draw it however you wish, and it can be ugly. No one else is gonna see it outside of this room. Yeah. I want to have a conversation about your intention behind that line, that shape. You know, like it's kind of like organizing your thoughts, right? Yeah. If you organize your thoughts. It's like organizing a bookshelf. If yeah. you're automatically putting all of these books in alphabetical order by just picking up piles of them and just putting them in, I don't know what sort of superpowers you have, but <laughs> for me, I need to organize the books first, yeah, and then put them up in their, you know, in their bricks, right? And so when you're when I'm designing or when I'm ideating, and if, if these are abstract ideas of what conveys emotion, uh, or what conveys um, uh, a disposition of a character in a shot. What angle should I be in? I have to organize them. And man, does that organize, organization look like shit? Yeah. It's really shitty sketches. But there's something about that that I don't want to ever lose. And what really inspired me to continue that direction, to, to solidify that, you know what, I believe in this direction, was when I saw the sketches of Sid Mead. Yeah. Holy shit, dude. 
like during art center i got really fortunate to do an independent study with sid wow and i that's would go to his house and I'd watch him that's work. it that's incredible <laughs> oh shit <laughs> it was the most inspiring and terrifying thing i yeah. had experienced at the time i would watch him do what looked like this bird's nest of of just abstract activity yeah but it, he would say it was energy and the wow. directionality of the energy and then it would come out to be this really cool beautiful environment with a vehicle and with people and i began to realize that his process of machine learning or pattern recognition was finding the patterns in the flow of energy in the sketch. Yeah. And I see it in Glenn Keane when he does like the, the figure studies, right? Yep. Yep. And there's something to that. I, I think the human brain tends to want to organize or make sense of what it sees, right? And so if you're designing architecture, the spacing of each pillar is absolutely perfect. But there's something to nature. There's something to the the organic aspects of our life, where there's a flow. Yeah. You know, something as beautiful as the wrinkles of a jacket on a man that's posing in class, or the the pose of a character that's trying to throw a grenade in the last moment of a film. Yeah. There's a gesture to that that is not mechanical. Yeah. It is not mechanical, and when it is, it looks like shit. It feels wrong. Yeah. And when I saw Sid doing that, I realized that it always results as very refined and mechanical. I mean, that guy's the king of it to this yeah. day. Yeah, definitely. But I never knew it started there. That's so crazy. And when I saw his ugly sketches, he told me to start doing that with him. And I did it. Yeah. And that's what I'm now delegating to my students. Like, fuck what it looks like. It's not going up on Art Station. It's not going on Facebook. The end result will. Yeah. But take this with you. Imagine your sketch like a cloud. You know, you look up, you look up in the sky, and you say, "Hey, that looks like a, that looks like an elephant. That looks like a baby, right?" Everyone kind of sees their own thing. It's almost like a. I don't know if you've ever seen like a Rorschach. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Anyone that's not familiar with that, they take a piece of paper, they fold it in half, and on one yep. side they drop ink, and then they fold it, and they open it up, and they hold up this beautiful butterfly-looking pattern, and they ask you, "What does this make you think of?" And people respond. My dad was a dick. <laughs> <laughs> we see what we want to see, right? Yeah. And if you go into your to your your Rorschach or your 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 abstract sketch with keywords, so there's already an intention behind the abstract. Yeah. And then you look at them through the monocle or through the filter of those keywords. Those are almost like your your beacon. That's what's taking you on your journey. You then begin to erase away. It's this beautiful sort of. Um, notion of like you're not bringing the shape t to clarity you're erasing away the mistakes to clarity okay you know like yeah. it's almost like wiping the sand away the dirt away the clouds away and you're working towards clarity and it's much less stressful to take something out of a design than try to figure out what to throw into it to make it interesting yeah I don't know if you've, you've had that experience. You know, part of, I, I again, I've had it with music, have not had it as much with art. And I think for me, I'm still in that early phase of, I, I'm in a phase where I'm just trying to get control of, of how I can draw, how I can paint, how I can do that. Yeah. And for me, it's a, it was with music, it was learning scales, it was imitating. Yeah. And I feel like I'm so early on. I just started uh, really delving into art three years ago at this point now and no way yeah i left school three years ago so it's this is Holy all shit this is, <laughs> you are fucking driven thank you i have thank watched you. your videos and and i was telling you this earlier i it's i think clarity and education especially art education is it's such a rare thing it's one thing that john is very very good at articulating yeah the thought process before the line yeah yeah it's yeah. like the ray tracing engine in your in your in, in your renderer exactly right? yep. <laughs> before you start doing that line of rendering yeah. and it's it's so it's so hard to articulate because in many ways many artists are very romantic about their approach and so when it comes to describing it there's a lot of hand waving and not a lot of um linear thought yeah and for me the 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 experience of actually teaching has been trying to organize all of this exactly yeah Right, and I think that process of teaching is actually like sharpening your own always process. Right? Always, yeah. And 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 that's been a whole other challenge, and and I love it. It's it's when I, I, I think one of the funnest things about teaching a course, 
is when you say some word like jibber jabber that's total word salad and somebody's eyes light up and then they come back and they fucking show you the most amazing <laughs> like idea and you're yeah. like holy shit i don't take credit for it i don't feel like i was the reason for it but it's almost like a mutation in the journey of that artist and yeah. it's it's a beautiful thing to witness because you see them also grow yeah and that inspires you or inspires definitely, me definitely in my experience maybe it's a little bit more selfish but i i like when a student will ask me something that's so dumbfounding to me that i have no idea what the answer is but i have all of these 30 eyes on me or something yeah and i say well there's a bunch of people watching me and i've been asked a question that i don't know the answer to let's figure it out yeah and that process of having to figure out that answer under that stressful condition is like yeah. again mother is the or no necessity is the mother of invention that's the one yeah, yeah. i'm gonna say it again and mess it up but yeah I, I found that by teaching i've been in this position where I, one you have to always clarify what you're doing you have to you don't always have to have such a strict process but you need to have intention behind what you're doing and uh for me my learning process was always influenced by how i learned music i feel like i had a decade of experience of learning before getting into art so i kind of had a pretty structured approach and for me it was always try to get those those fundamentals down first mm -hmm. and uh after you could do those fundamentals and kind of get that language uh have an understanding of that language then you could express yourself you know do you have you found any similarities behind your approach or your experience in music versus a sketch like direct connection it's, it's it's so for me it's so similar because i write music that was very i wrote metal and it's very technical and uh it requires a lot of physical skill yeah um and when you're doing something that's technical like that as i mentioned you can't always make a technical piece good it yeah. takes a lot of energy or a lot of effort to get something that's technical to evoke any emotions yeah because it has that tendency to to feel like a computer or feel too rigid and i think that's part of why my sketches like especially throughout learning have been very stiff and it's taken a lot of time uh to loosen up and get to a point where i can just mm. sort of do something that's technical but still be loose with it and with art i'm working on that every day yeah but with music i can play something that I guess in hindsight would be rather technical, but I can improvise it. Yeah. yeah. And I think, I, I do think there's a very similar approach and there's a very similar, um, very similar interests in either or, Yeah. you know, with, with metal music, uh, it, it's tough to play all those notes and get them right on, uh, you know, and hit them at the perfect time with line drawing and pen. It's like, you have very limited room for error or yeah. you, and it's once it's down it's done it's done yeah. and i kind of like that i I, yeah. I know even when i was playing music live uh, a lot of artists nowadays will use they'll have backing tracks so they'll have things where they can they'll have fail safes yeah but with line drawing there's no fail safes or with playing a live music without any backing tracks there's no fail safes yeah and the errors are always there yeah and i love that what's well, clarity yeah. right yeah. You, know, you know, to go back to the notion of machine learning, you know, if you've made a strike or you've made a line, it is very valuable to then do another one. Yeah. And see how much you've missed it, how much you've literally missed the mark. Yeah. And let's call that the ugly sketch. Right. And you can put another piece of tracing paper on top and now refine. Right. Yeah. Delete the mistakes. Right. And that's been the only way to get rid of stiffness. And my figures are still very stiff. So to, t to speak to the technical side, let's say the artist that is pursuing figure drawing and sculpting uh, like an ecorche of like uh, the figure of a human being and really understanding the muscles, there's something to that as well that when you learn about a shape or form to such detail, even the mechanical purpose behind it, that when you look at that fucking abstract sketch cloud, yeah, you see the damn joint. Yeah. Yeah. If anything, you were thinking about it. So when John or any amazing artist does this pen sketch where it's just shadow and line, I'm telling you, they see the final thing. Yeah. And that's not talent. At least I don't believe that's talent. It's not, I wasn't. No, I don't think it's talent. I think it's something. I actually don't believe it. in talent. Yeah. Unless it's physiological, like singing or. 
but you can put the jump really high and yeah. <laughs> make a dunk. You know, I can't do that. No. <laughs> but it's just hard work. Yeah. It's it's fighting yourself in your inner voice. I think doing that, and I'm speaking to myself here too. I'm mm-hmm. definitely, man, my inner voice is a dick. <laughs> I, am, I beat myself up so much. And I remember one of my students asking me, because um, he wanted to kind of get into designing films, and he asked me for some advice. And he told me what the secret was. Oh. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, cats just come on the. <laughs> let me just move her so she doesn't no, 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 turn no, no, no. off. Well, oh. sometimes she hits the power button and then oh, everything no. turns off. <laughs> um, but go on. You were saying something. Uh, you were talking about your student. Your inner well, voice. yeah, like uh, he he asked me for like the secret or the uh, one quick tip. Yeah. And man, did I think that that's what it took when I was a kid? Well, I still am a kid. Uh, in Art Center, I, I picked up every brush that every awesome artist that I saw was using. The right brush from Japan. I ordered it on Amazon. <laughs> yeah. It came in three days. Nice. I was an artist now. I, yeah. I was wielding the sword of the warrior. Yeah. And I love that false sense of confidence. It helps cultivate the, a learning environment. But it is not the way to learn. Yeah. At least not for me. I, 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 I told him that you've got to just be honest with yourself. That's, yeah, you have to be not only your biggest critic but your most honest critic in a way that your structured sort of analysis of your own approach or your own work or your own art is not only seeing the defects for lack of a better word of your decisions it's to see how to clarify and work your way towards what you intended intentionally you know i always call my sketches or especially the films i make the cousins of the original idea yeah. it is never the brother or the sister or this or, <laughs> or the, the actual your baby your idea right yeah and the way i kind of and if i get the cousin man i'm fucking happy yeah and i hope one day i work my way towards getting to the actual idea that i had in my head but it's sort of like trying to catch a butterfly. Mm-hmm. You know, it's always fluttering around and you see this one thing and you think about this other thing and the idea kind of evolves. And, and so you're always trying to capture it. Yeah. And um, so long as you can get very close to it, I, I think you can consider it a, a success for that for that ex- exercise. Right? Yeah. And you can always, for me, it's anytime I, you know, you said something about you do a painting and then the next day you don't like it, which is, I think that's fine. Yeah. You, you shouldn't like it the next day because no, you, you can always wake up that next day and say, I'll just make it better. Yeah. And you constantly keep pushing yourself. Yeah. And yeah, it's, it's one of, I think one of the best things about doing a creative endeavor or I guess any endeavor, be it yeah. sports, be it medicine. You know, I have a friend still in medical school and he's constantly pushing himself yeah. every day. Yeah. And, uh, it's just any sort of passion. It's just that noble cause. You have yeah. something that to, to work towards. You know, it's, you know, for me, it, it's weird. By thinking of it technically, I become more romantic or abstract in my approach. Yeah. And what I mean by technically is I look at myself and I wonder why I'm feeling that way. Yeah. It's something I've recently started to do. My my wife is a is a psychologist. And oh, so okay. we in our spare time <laughs> after work, we talk about the human mind and it's 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 awesome. It's awesome. And I and I love how she sees the world and I would never want to talk to somebody that sees the world from my perspective because that would be redundant and boring. And yeah. And I and I love seeing the way she sees the mind. And I began to read a lot about the human brain uh Specifically, you know, what structures make it up. And it began to actually help me with my design process. Interesting. Um, so <laughs> let's, uh, I'll try not to get too technical or too in-depth. Um, but if you split the mind in half, or the brain in half, right? Down with hemisphere. The corpus you, callosum. Yeah. <laughs> and, you look, and you look at it from the side. Sorry. No, 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 no. You're right. I didn't even know that's what uh, it was called. <laughs> and uh, if you look at it from the side, you... You begin to see that's kind of like a jawbreaker. It's mm-hmm. got layers. Mm-hmm. I don't think a lot of people know this, but the your your cortex. The uh, some people are used to hearing cortex because they hear uh, cerebral cortex. But you have an occipital cortex. You have the outer bark. Cortex means bark. The outer thin layer of your brain, which I think if you yeah if you un if you peeled it off, it would be the size of a dinner, dinner napkin. That's you. That's actually yeah. the guy that's talking or the gal that's talking, right? That's the intelligent mind. It's yeah. this dense, 
dinner napkin layer of fucking neurons yeah a machine learning neural networks that just recognize patterns and associate them with either some meaning or something that has to do with evolution right yeah that's dangerous don't do that right and then at the center of your brain there's your reptilian mind yes. right <laughs> yeah you know it, like the brain literally evolved inside out right and 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 at the center of your mind is your your amygdala hippocampus thalamus and those are all the things that we would consider the emotional aspect of who you are right yeah the it's the part of you that feels love that feels angst that feels fear and physically feels it physically feels it because yeah. that is directly connected to your spinal cord right yeah. and that goes out to your nervous system and here you are if you're like me hunching over with back pain while you sketch because <laughs> you're 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 you have so much anxiety that you suck right and so if you look at your mind as this jawbreaker that the inside is feel that your, your inner voice is yeah. feeling like you're lost or, or feeling that your sketch isn't going well or you're not a good artist it's firing those signals outward yeah to the dinner napkin wrapped around the outside the wrinkly part on the outside right uh it's wrinkly because it had to fold upon itself yep. as it grew to fit in your little head right? i just want to say i love how accurate your biology knowledge <laughs> is right now it's great it, it's not that accurate it's it's, it's it's as accurate as it needs to be it, yeah exactly exactly <laughs> I, I'm sure there are specialists watching me right now and thinking I'm a total fool. No. I, I, if I'm messing anything up, send me an article. Yeah. I want to read it. I do. Sure. You know, please help me oh, learn. Yeah. yeah, we can we can do a little uh, neurology. Just... <laughs> so your inner voice is shooting outward to your conscious or your uh, cognitive mind, right? The one that's thinking about the more technical shit. And, and what yeah. happens is if you're like me, you gravitate towards research and you just google the hell out of what you're about to do yeah and you can find a million images of, of of what you want to design so if you're doing a castle you're finding every single castle of every kind from every culture from every continent and you're really good at it and maybe you're trying to compensate is yeah you're trying to push down that center part of your mind that's that's uh anxious and and at least this is my experience and 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 a part of me is like okay i understand the logical approach you need to understand the content you're creating um, but the emotions behind it, I would argue, is what makes it human. Yeah. Between, you know, we're going to see in our lifetime machines designing things. Um, some of those things will be better than what humans make in the context of a mechanical joint or a suspension system for a vehicle. Based on the mountains of data it will be fed to redesign a interface or a system. But when it comes to art or music, you're trying to convey emotion. And predicting emotion is not something that's linear. Yeah. It's like trying to predict the stock market. It's, it's, it's not as easy as just analyzing the patterns. Yeah. This culture, stuff changes, man. Like fashion changes every, every few months now. Yeah. <laughs> What's yeah. cool changes all the time. And, and, and I think you just have to live a little. You have to be a human being and you have to analyze all the things you're feeling as well. Yeah. From the outside in. Like, why am I feeling this way? Why does it make me feel this way? How can I use this in my design? <laughs> you yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. And, and like, and, and, and that's why like when it comes to like filmmaking, it's like, okay, if I've successfully captured or conveyed a particular emotion in a shot, you know, not to go off the rail here, but that's totally let's <laughs> go as far off the rail. Let's, as you let's say you're doing a keyframe. Yeah. And the keyframe is for me the most daunting thing. Like you can design a prop, a vehicle, a character, a costume, a gun. Yeah. It's beautiful because it's almost a graphic study, you know. Sometimes you draw it from the side, sometimes you model it. But you're almost focused on the micro aspect of it. Yeah. And when you see it in the context of a shot when it's primarily in the dark and it's barely being lit, it's like yeah fuck <laughs> it yeah. doesn't do what i was hoping for you're almost designing a puppet yeah you don't control the animation you don't control the way it's captured and you don't need necessarily need to there's specialists that are very good at that but if you look at it from their perspective you're gonna, you're going to make not only their lives a lot easier but your design more successful at least i believe so yeah in the context of films and games and for me when you're when you're doing a keyframe and if I always see it from the perspective of the of a camera because I'm so used to holding a camera, looking through the viewfinder, yeah. changing lenses. And I, I really do believe, I, I advocate 
for you to pick up a camera and yes. get some lenses. Yeah, that's actually a big part of what I talk about in my class. Yeah, yeah. you know, look, look at your eyeball, right? Well, I mean, yeah. you can't look at it. You're looking through <laughs> it, right? But your eyes are a lens, but that lens is a very specific uh, restriction. It cannot see certain things in a certain way. Yeah. And if you think of lenses as these... Uh, these other versions of telescopes. Right? Yeah. They bend light and distort light in different ways. And so you get wide angle lenses, you get telephoto lenses, and it's essentially compacting the photons. Yeah. And if you learn the way that a lens can distort light, the difference between a GoPro shot and a, and a telescope shot of a snowboarder jumping from like a ramp, the emotion behind it is vastly varied. Yeah. One is exhilarating because you're there. Yeah. And the other one is epic because it's like, whoa, that was like 300 feet in the air. Yeah. But the content's the same. But the perspective is different. Exactly. And I think to design a keyframe, if you if you mess around with cameras, just play with them. I, I think you begin to learn what distortions of light make you feel what in a particular scenario. And so when I'm doing a keyframe, I put myself in in the position of the camera as if the audience's head <laughs> it's gonna sound really weird no but fuck it this is the way i think yeah. about it if you're watching a movie and there's a particular scene i always imagine that you're holding the audience's head from the back like you're almost like cradling yeah. their head where their ears are in your hands and you're looking they're looking forward and you're slowly moving their head left or right up and down and sometimes if you take a particular scenario like let's say of a mother and father having a argument one interesting way to see it is where the camera's all shaky and it's following them, right? And you can do any cool sort of lighting. But the second you take that audience's head and put it from the perspective of a toddler, from a crib, yeah. or from underneath the dining table, that same exact motion of the geometry, of the light being captured, once you change the angle and the distortion of it, you've altered almost the impact or the... Or the or how much it resonates. Yeah. You can you can influence a person's perspective literally by where you place the camera. And so when you're doing a keyframe, it really helps to to study cameras, to, to play with them. You don't need to become a specialist, but to play with them. You can rent lenses. If you have CG do, look at your primitive cube with a 100 millimeter lens and an 18 millimeter lens and look at the difference that it distorts it with yeah and that changes everything and for me when i when i do my own work it's where am i in in the shot who am yeah. i yeah and most of the time you're not a character so i always imagine myself as an apparition in a way like like a almost like a floating ghost if i was you know telling the story of christmas past you know yeah. like where is <laughs> it, where is this uh we're screwed standing, you know, looking yeah. at this moment. And, uh, and and that allows you to create a narrative, a perspective of a story. And, and and when you bring that into concept art, it can make something as, as technical as a vehicle design feel like home. Interesting. You know what I mean? Yeah. It, it's, and you know what? Like, like the, the psychological aspect behind design and, and what emotions it ignites I think that's the magic of what we do as yeah. concept artists because it takes a lot of money. It takes a lot of people to make the final picture. Yeah. But if you can prove with just painting light on a Photoshop document that it could possibly work if it had these shapes, these materials, this possible angle, you're not dictating the cinematography in, in any way. But if you can influence the decisions, you're adding to the clarity to the final laser beam that's being shot out of the projector and being shown to Americans all over the U.S. Yeah. And the more I can sharpen that tool, the happier I am. Yeah. And so, like, right now, like, on Avatar, I, I, I'm working with the best people that do that. Yeah. That are so fucking good at that. And I just study them i study what they do and i try to mimic it I'm, a, I'm completely a student in the studio and i'm i think i'm happiest when i'm a student that's awesome i, I mean yeah. do you feel the same way i do feel the same way and i just want to say i'm i'm i think we're gonna have everybody that's working on the avatar sequels here on the podcast that's awesome and um every one of you have said that you all have felt like a student in comparison to the other which yeah. i think is 
I think it's great. It's, it's you guys keep learning from each other. You keep pushing I, each other. I'm the smallest student of all, for sure. You wouldn't be I the first the, to say I have, that. <laughs> I have the least amount of experience out of anyone I work with, and man, is that the best scenario I could ever have ever asked yeah. for? Because it's the best feeling in the world is being the dumbest person in the room for me. Because if I'm saying things and I'm contributing things that could be improved on, there are other people in the room who will suggest those improvements. Yeah. And it's almost like uh, an adjustment of your course. And there's the whole other aspect that the work is absolutely inspiring. Yeah. The, the, you know, one thing that I've gotten out of working with these giants is this idea of, of clarity in design. It's, it's fundamentally a design house. Yeah. We, we, are, we are not having conversations about trendy things about trendy approaches or, or, or shortcuts. It's always about like this game of fruit slice. Like how do you slice the fruit at the right angle at the right time to get to the end goal, to get the audience at a subconscious level, to understand, to feel what you're trying to convey. Yeah. And whether that's hard surface design or organic design or, or, or like this, the world we do in Avatar, it, it's incredibly hard. Yeah. Because if you, if you don't succeed, the audience is kind of snapped out of the experience. I, yeah. I kind of think of watching movies uh, similarly to like being in a in a trance. Yeah, you know, or like really, you really are. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like I'm sure, like when you listen to music, you absolutely love. Yeah, it almost relaxes you, and you kind of could close your eyes and wonder. Yeah, you know, like a really good book or a really good experience, and sometimes it takes you back to your own memories too. Right? Yeah, and I think films on a subconscious level are scrolling through your memories. You yeah, know? and when you see yourself in a in a film, even if it's on an alien planet with alien characters, if the shape design, the form language, and the psychology behind the decisions fundamentally appeal to the subconscious mind, you're slowly tugging at strings, helping people along understand the story you're trying to convey. Yeah, and to study that is is exhilarating. It's fun, and and whether you're painting, whether you're making music, or or you're shooting a film. Yeah, it's all the same rules. It's how not to fuck it up. Yeah, right. Yeah, it's how to work yourself towards clarity. There's so yeah, and there's so much overlap of everything. Even I, I know for me when I'm ever drawing or and now I've been trying to animate, I'm always thinking of what the soundtrack would be doing behind it. Oh my god! And how that blends together, and and it's almost. I always listen to music when I draw. I know a lot of people have there's some controversy about whether or not that's beneficial, but it's always influencing everything that I do. It's always from learning from I don't know, just everything I've done in my life has always been influenced by that early piece of writing music. It was such a big part of my life. Mm. And I think for me, it is the strongest way to convey emotions at the moment. You know, for you, it's light and, and, and I, I would, I would argue music as well. I, yeah. I'm not nearly as knowledgeable about music as you. Um, but one thing that I got away from, that I took away from filmmaking, is sound plays yes. just yeah. a big role. Yeah. You know, we've heard that sound is also dialogue, but you've got to realize that when a character is talking in a coffee shop or in a cave, the sound, the resonance, gives you a sense of volumetric space. Yeah. And so, although you're in a theater or in your home or on your phone, you're looking through a window. At some point, the borders of that frame disappear. And if they they've disappeared, the cinematographer has done their job. Yeah. If they reappear, maybe it was intentional, right? Okay. Like, we could, that's a whole other topic. <laughs> but if everyone's looking through this giant window and they they forgot that it's a window, yeah. And the music helps convey the other universe you're currently observing. The sound is just as important as the light. Yeah. You, you you can't get the sense of space without the absence of it. Yeah. And you can't get the sense of someone's struggle in the bathroom when they're looking at a pregnancy test without the echo of it. Yeah. It's it's so important. And I think it's, uh, it's um, for music, uh, for my own personal work and sometimes uh, with my film work, I will find a track. I'll make a, I'll make a playlist for the project. Yeah. And it will be curated as if I was, I always get into the directorial chair and say, if I were to direct this, yeah. what track would I use for the scene? And so I, I like, I have these artists that I absolutely love. Like, I love Patrick O'Hearn. 
I, I, I love like old Beethoven, anything from the Romantic era, anything that is very minimalistic, but also electronic sometimes. Okay. I, I gravitate towards, and they make you feel a certain way. Yeah. It makes yeah. the kind of the creative process much funner and playful. Yeah, I think so. I think so. It, it completely, it just gets you in that mindset of what emotion you're trying to evoke. And, you know, whether it's writing down a passage, which is always, every time I do that, the product always comes out better. If I write down what it is I'm trying to feel, just the way you said, yeah. uh, too often I don't do that. I, but I think it's so helpful because that is why we're doing this. That's why we create anything. Yeah. Uh, now for you, when are you going to become a director? When, you know, when, are, you, <laughs> when are we going to see your first feature length film? Because the, I, I want to buy it. I want to see it. <laughs> I, I want to see it too. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Because I think what's so powerful about what, you know, every, just listening to you speak, you you have that, an artistic mindset, and it would be really interesting to see that come to film. And I think somebody, you know, like with the Avatar sequels, uh, James Cameron, he's a really good artist as well. I've seen his sketches. It's, oh, my God. Yeah. 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 And Oh, my God. Yeah. He will draw over your sketch and improve it. It's incredible. I've... He'll put three lines down, and I'm not exaggerating. It'll it'll improve the proportions and the rhythm of it. And from a director, yeah, holy fuck, yeah. Yeah. that has been one of the most like that has been probably one of the most inspirational things I've seen is the the clarity in the communication. You know, to have a conversation like if we were talking about something highly technical. We could say a lot of words, and yeah. each word could try to clarify the statement. But to think it through before you open your mouth and to only say a few words would be to try to say the most simplistic, clear statement possible. And in that, at that point, we're exchanging ideas, right? Yeah. And Jim, when he puts a line down, it's almost natural because I think... His mind is almost in tune to always working that way, and I'm and, and I'm not gonna lie, I'm trying to get myself there because yeah. here you have a human being that can paint and draw anything, and they can tell the most crazy, insane visual story. And many directors try this, many artists try this, and they sometimes lose the audience in the visual effects, and the crazy music, and the sound effects, and the lack, and the lack of feeling empathy for the characters. Yeah. And here is a human being that has figured out how to pull the strings of light, of sound, of color, of visual effects, of motion capture, like the ultimate version of puppetry. Yeah. And he's able to pull the reins and keep you engaged. And have you feel something for something that does not exist necessarily, right? Yeah. And that has been it's like fucking magic, dude. And I and I and I study it and I and I and I and I especially um pay attention to the notes and I try to find the psychological reasoning behind it. Yeah. It always goes back to that for me because again we're talking about our, our minds in a way, right? Like if we're writing a sheet of music or, or we're we're sketching something that we're thinking of first we're feeling it then we're probably anchoring it to a, a, an experience like a, a memory or a smell or a sound and then we're testing it right? yeah and then it's this feedback loop back and forth back and forth back and forth and to my ultimate goal is to be able to make that feedback loop like on high octane yeah clear three lines here's your notes and it's like holy shit that fixed it yeah and and so when it comes to directing, I I always wanted to go to Art Center for film long term, right? For yeah. five years of film, and instead I had two years, and I still feel like I'm in film school. Yeah. Even though I'm I'm I'm, I'm doing concept art, I I see the idea in its entire process from sketch to to, to at least motion capture animation camera angles decisions that were made with the puppets that we yeah. had designed and I, I i don't mean puppets in a derogatory way either yeah i do believe that you know when you're creating a world it, it, you need to create the elements or the ingredients that create that world and i think yeah. of them as puppets yeah you know? no that's a good point too because like when you're you mentioned before you were creating a gun and you're modeling like designing every aspect of it and in yeah. the final film you don't see that necessarily yeah 
but the fact that there was more thought put into it than maybe almost necessary yeah. creates a better final piece. It's yeah. if let's say hypothetically that piece does need to be shown in full detail, you have it. Yeah. And it I think yeah. it gives everybody after you it, it gives everybody that, that comes after your step the the proper tools necessary. It builds the yeah. whole yeah. um with Lord of the Rings for example, the Cimmerillion. I love it. Yeah. One of my favorite designs. I'm sure the the um and even going back to the original novel in the novel, there's a lot of detail that's not included in the Silmarillion, which talks about all the world and all the aspects of it. Yeah. But all of those things that they built influenced the final novel. Yeah. You know, actually, one of my favorite things is the designs of the Harry Potter films. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, I didn't necessarily read all the books. I read till the second one, um, only because I, I had ADD. I had to, like, always change shit. <laughs> I couldn't really commit to one thing. Yeah. You know, um, but when I saw the Harry Potter films, the design, the production design behind, especially the later films, yeah, and the lighting and the cinematography, they took something that is so magical, and, and none of this shit exists, right? Similar to how Avatar had the same challenge at the beginning, and all these films that we're talking about, and and it was able to create a convincing world, yeah. maintain the trance, maintain the the illusion that there is no window, right? And and whether or not you're designing Voldemort's face or Harry Potter's scar and doing thousands of graphic studies as to what to do and wondering if it's cheesy or if people are going to laugh, you're really questioning psychologically how effective is this trance going to be? Yeah. Right? Like like a musician doing like a setup, right? Yeah. That's going to have like lights and projections and color and sound. They must be thinking, how do I keep people on this journey? How do I keep them hyping the whole yeah. time and it's almost like this sense of flow in a way you know mm -hmm. like it's like uh it's like a running river of water right if you put the stones all in the wrong place and you're gonna cause a lot of uh turmoil you're gonna cause a lot of friction and then the, yeah. the waves are not gonna be as flowy and they're gonna kind of crash and lose momentum and then when you do that in a story or in a painting or in a film you can sense it you're like oh, i, I um, these lines don't feel right this character is not interesting to me i don't empathize with what i'm watching and you turn it off it doesn't matter how beautiful it is it does not yeah you can have a very successful design using the approaches the abstract approach i'm talking about of, of trying to design emotion in a way and it could fail on screen and then learn from it i mean i love watching films that aren't rated well okay yeah uh, one of my favorite things to do is watch them in black and white oh interesting like i've watched batman the first batman by nolan in black and white so many times and i realized that when i remove one of the ingredients i notice the other ones okay you know yeah. what i mean it's like it's like seeing the underpainting exactly uh, i'm not saying i fully understand it but yeah. it's like seeing the the way that they might have or like removing sound or rewatching the scene like uh i don't do this to my wife but sometimes i do but when we're watching a film i'll press pause and be like okay i gotta see that one more time and we'll do it and I'm like, okay, I got to see it one more time and we'll do it again. And I'll rewatch it and I'll save that, that pattern I just analyzed yeah. in my folder, right, of reference in my head. And, and, and so when it comes to directing, I definitely one day would love the opportunity to test out my theories. It's yeah. not necessarily about like, it's not about being a director or, or or even filmmaking it's it's not about what comes with that it, it, it's the same itch i get when i do a personal painting and i show it to somebody somebody that i really care about their opinion and i and i ask them if they feel anything and and, and i found in my work that any time that i can not, not lose the butterfly in the ideation process that fun feeling of like trying to go from abstract to clarity yeah. from this shitty sketch to the final thing that is supposed to evoke a certain emotion the more i can stick to that path the more it is conveyed yeah and sometimes i'm not, I'm, I'm, I'm unsuccessful I'm actually most of the time and sometimes i'm not and when it comes to moving picture i feel like it's tenfold with yeah. music with acting yeah and it's almost the greatest it's the greatest challenge and for me it, it i guess that's the sort of for for lack of a better word a ma the mountain peak or the top yeah you know once you get to there there's the fog clears there's another mountain peak yeah. right so it's not, it's never yeah. really even about yeah. that <laughs> but that is that challenge is fucking hard and yeah. i would love to actually try it out of all places on instagram 
Okay. Because it's a short window of time to keep someone's interest and to yeah. get their attention and to convey something psychologically. And that's a great test because that's a yeah. new test that yeah. hasn't existed before. And it's setting it's it's setting the goal a little bit smaller than an hour long film, yes, which yes. is always important not to jump the, the yeah. gun. But it's also, I think, film is so interesting because it's the culmination of all these art forms. It's yeah. painting, it's music, it's uh, sound design, which is even separate from music, and all of that comes together and it tests each one of those skills. Yeah. And uh, I, I would be really interesting to see an Instagram movie. First of all, I, now that IGTV, I guess, is something that's a little bit more. Uh, coming to fruition I think maybe that would be a platform you could use for that uh, yeah right now currently due to my schedule and and crazy hours yeah. <laughs> which are understandable for you know what we yeah. do um, I've, I've kind of been focusing a lot on the 3d end of the pipeline yeah to do films in cinema 4d and using octane renderer and and uh, I've kind of made a I always find myself coming to a point in my life where I'm like ah, I'm not where I want to be I want to be there or I want to be left or right. Right. I, I'm, I'm never where I want to be. Yeah. But in, in the good way, in the good sense that I'm like, okay, okay I got to continue on this hike. I got to pick up my yeah. bag. I had a nice break. I got to continue on this hike. And, and so for me, Instagram and the computer system I own and, and the software I have, these are like ingredients to create something. Yeah. One's a platform to release it. And the other one, it allows me to direct for free making a commercial or making a music video is an insanely expensive process. Finding the actors, finding the locations, finding the weather, the location, the, the, the angle of the sun at that time, yeah. planning each shot, doing a shot list. I've done art, uh, I've done assistant directing, directing, producing, uh, production design. And it's like, I've, I'm trying all of them because each one is a, a learning experience because yeah. at the end, if the goal is to create a moving picture, it's nice to be able to understand from every angle. Because yeah. it's almost adding to the to the accuracy of uh, of that shot with the sniper, right? You yep. got to get the crossers just lined and get your breath just focused enough to be able to take it. Man, that is a morbid way to look at it. But, <laughs> but um, I, I think to be able to learn to go back to this process of learning, you have to constantly make mistakes, do master yeah. copies, and all this stuff. And I think Instagram, because it's so, such a small platform and such small videos or any sort of online content, and plus that shit reaches more people than TV yeah. today. Yeah, it does. It definitely does. And and for me, it's like any opportunity to make a mistake, to learn, to learn, to learn. It's easier to do, and it's more feasible to to do right now on a platform like that with the tools I have. Yeah. I have a computer. I have these pieces of software. What can I make? Yeah, it's like a new challenge, and it and it, and at the same time you're directing it because yeah. I'm making the storyboard, I'm animating it, and so currently right now I'm working on a on a short film. Oh, okay, wonderful. Uh, that uh, that I work on on my free time that I'm 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 hoping to release on Instagram. Awesome. Yeah, I can't wait to see that. Oh my lord. <laughs> Me either, man. Yeah. It's uh it, to go back to the to the the message of of uh, my office mates. Uh, real artists finish and yes. <laughs> I'm going to finish this I have to finish this because it's the newest challenge for me to finish it because it's not easy wow well it, we've been going for almost two hours I oh don't want to I don't want to cut no, you no, no, off no, no. because this is an amazing is amazing to listen to you but I think that note that you left off on was a wonderful place to leave it that real artists finish just like real podcasts finish. <laughs> <laughs> it's a beautiful thing. Yeah. I do not want to hear my voice for more than that. No, this time. has been wonderful. Seifel, thank you so much. This is, thank you for having me. No, thank you so much. It's been an honor. Everybody, thanks for tuning in. We will talk to you all soon. Take care. Peace out, everybody. Bye. Oh, man.